Hello. Hi. Thanks for joining us um, to talk about the making of the making of Zombie Wars, <laughs> uh, Sasha's new book. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge to discuss a work in progress because obviously none of you have read it. Um, I feel lucky to have gotten to read it. Um, but we don't want to kind of, in movie parlance, give spoilers because um, I feel like now we were just talking about this. Movie trailers are already giving way too much away. All the plot points and the best lines to the point where you watch it and you're like, oh, I've already seen this <laughs> multiple times. But we want to give you some context so that um, you can kind of know what's to come. This book's coming out May 12th? May 12th, 2015. yes. 2015. So Sasha's going to read you a passage of the book, and we promise we're not giving away everything. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, um, I'm very happy and flattered to be here, to be in the same building as David Bowie. <laughs> and he's in the building. Um, we just don't know where exactly. Yes, we, we found some instruments in the green room, and so, you know, who knows? Um, the book that we will be talking about is entitled The Making of Zombie Wars. And uh, it is in this stage that is very frightening to me where I'm done with it, but no one has read it, so it can all vanish. <laughs> so you might be the I only one. I have an extra one. copy. Right, well, I know, but in the, in the, in the minds of people, so um, you will be the witnesses that it existed, maybe, in the future. So this is the very beginning. Um, script idea number two. An elderly contract killer with a heart condition is forced to go into retirement after he failed at his last hit. It's his only miss, so when he has a chance to redo it and restore his perfect record, he cannot say no, even if he's risking a heart attack. But then he falls in love with the target's teenage daughter. Title, The Last Heart. Script idea number seven. A blind man and a blind woman attract to, attracted to each other by smell. On their first day, they find themselves at a murder scene and catch the killer's particular scent. Nobody believes them, and the perfume killer is now pursuing them. Title, where do we go from it? Nowhere. Script idea number 12. DJ Spinoza is a misfit no one understands. Not his schoolmates, not his friends, not his teachers. His one dream is to DJ at his prom night and blow all those assholes away. After his radical DJing results in a disastrous party at the place of the girl, whose name is Rise, he aims to hook up with, he ends up castigated. What will it take to make everyone dance and Rise fall for him? Title, spinning out of control. Now, what could I do with the boy? Joshua asks himself. All human feelings are derived from pleasure, pain, and desire, but most importantly, Spin could say to Rise from the beat. And what if he said nothing? What if he was the strong, silent type? Why this and not that? Writing is nothing if not carrying the hopeless, back-breaking burden of decisions devoid of consequences. Afternoon at the coffee shop slipped into the evening just as Joshua's caffeination reached the heights of the random plantations where his beverage originated. Hence, he was burning to serve the web for Rwanda to learn some interesting facts about other cultures and allow his current creative dilemmas to resolve themselves without him. Back in the day, before the world wide web of temptation, there used to be the thing called inspiration. Then the spirit was perpetually displaced by trivia and vanity search. Mercifully, there was no internet access, interest, internet access at the coffee shop. Hence, Joshua opened up a file with another script in perpetual development titled The Snake Man Blues, in which a comic book geek and a retired superhero, the Snake Man, and gainfully employed as a public school English teacher, team up to fight the evil mayor of Chicago. <laughs> <coughs> Joshua was incapable of deciding whether the Snake Man would die at the end or live to go back to teaching the truly heroic activity in the city of Chicago. And if so, whether he would do so in his human or his serpentine form. The happy ending was corny while the death was depressing and Joshua could think of nothing in between. Besides, how exactly would a reptile fight the Chicago Police Department and the devious mayor? Ram is unfightable, turns out. Um, 
too hypoglycemic to type a word, which would then perhaps lead to the next word, he could only perceive the blank space below what he'd written last. Snake man, don't. Let's take care of the boss first. Baruch the spinner was right. Infinity exhausts all reality. But finitude does too, almost. Joshua stared at the crosswalk outside a coffee shop where nothing was happening until he discovered some comfort in devising wisecracks for some imaginary audience at some future dinner party. How is shop, S-H-O-P-P-E, different from a shop? <laughs> Did the wife of Bath drink soy milk chai lattes? <laughs> Are the Middle English speaking baristas commonly stricken with black death, etc.? Et he was about to open a new file to log all the shop cracks when a pack of ROTC cadets appeared on the Olive Street horizon in faithfully slow motion, reminding him of that long shot in Lawrence of Arabia, where in the flatline desert, a speck grows into a horseman. The cadets forded the street, fake punching one another, slapping the shaven necks, no worry in their lives, save the fear of being expelled from the pack. And then he envisioned them in the desert, thickly coated in dust, tog hanging thirsty on their way to a battle where they would mature or heroically die. The nefarious natives offering them contaminated piss warm water in beaten teacups. The cadets couldn't begin to conceive of their sandstorming future. They couldn't as much as pity themselves in advance. In fact, they could see little beyond their imminent meal, beyond acting out their childish toughness, beyond play acting hand to hand combat at lunch break. He who has a mind capable of a great many things has a body whose greatest part is eternal, wrote Baruch Spinoza. And out of that sad ROTC mindlessness, the scene from Dawn of the Dead was recollected in which zombies tottered in circles all over the populated shopping mall, unable to forget their life before their undeath, their infected brains still retaining the remnants of their happy Christmas memories. A chubby cadet sensed the intensity of Joshua's inspired gaze and as the rest of the corps trundled on to the next door sandwich shop, stopped to grin at him from the other side of the window. His face was wide, his cheeks flushed, his front teeth of an even sizes like a skyline, his eyes lit up with arrogant innocence of youth. In a blissful blink, Joshua saw the nar narrative landscape neatly laid down before him, all the endless possibilities, all the overhead and wide shots, all the graceful character trajectories blazing across the spectacular firmament, all the expanse conducive to a love interest. All Joshua had to do was stroll through that Edenic filmic symmetry and write it down. This time, he was determined, his vision would not decompose in the computer memory with the skeletons of his other ideas. He opened, right there and there, a new final draft file and created the title page to stare at it. Zombie Wars by Joshua Levin, Chicago, March 31st. 2003, whereupon he stared at it. Alas, unless you're the Lord himself, creation cannot be willed. Joshua needed to eat something before embarking upon it, and hence stood in line behind an over-tattooed prick who couldn't decide between banana and pumpkin bread, <laughs> while the barista in a Che Guevara hat, yet presumably fluent in middle fucking English, looked on indifferently. The impasse allowed Joshua to imagine a zombie biting into the prick's neck tattoos, blood splashing the prepared lattes, turning them pick, the zombie oblivious to the hysterically hissing espresso machine. The revolutionary Chaucerian barista, artistically striving for the perfect form, took an eternity to steam the milk for Joshua's cappuccino, giving enough time for the zombie apocalypse to smoothly exhaust its cataclysmic reality and sink to the bottom of Joshua's mind. Back at the shaky table, he sat munching on carrot bread until he reached a zen-worthy level of caffeine crash blankness. He closed the file, then the program, and then finally his computer to put it in his bag to sleep. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So my boy, Joshua Levin, he's uh, an aspiring but talentless screenwriter. And he has uh, uh, a number of script ideas in his computer file and constantly coming up anew. He never ever finishes anything. Um, and so the book begins with his brightest new idea to write a script called Zombie Wars.
Um, and from this point on, he goes to to a creative writing workshop where there are other amateurs like him. Um, and then, um, because his day job is teaching English as a second language, and I'll read a, an excerpt from his classroom a little later, he meets a Bosnian woman, and um, and the, an attraction develops between them. At the same time, he has an insane landlord um, who gets involved, and they all and has a girlfriend uh, of his. She's Japanese American, Kimiko, with whom he ends up living um, while developing this attraction with the Bosnian woman, and from there on, uh, the complications are greater and greater and greater <laughs> until um, everything crashes. And you, you know? intersperse the uh, narrative with script ideas that Josh has. Well, Joshua is obsessively coming up with script ideas, uh, pitches, uh, dozens of them. Um, you know, he's whatever he looks at might trigger a script idea, but they never go anywhere. They're all, all, all pitches for some future uh, meeting in Hollywood. He never gets to Hollywood. At some point in the book, he me meets a local agent who works with actors in Chicago and who gives him um, some kind of advice. That doesn't go well either. And he thinks that that agent might be able to set him up with Gwyneth Paltrow, but he... <laughs> <laughs> well, whereas the agent said, you know, I can show this to Gwyneth, and Joshua says, Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow? And the agent said, no, it's Gwyneth Spica. <laughs> Gwyneth Spica, she was very good at Improv Hamlet um, recently because she represents Gwyneth Spica. <laughs> I'm particularly proud of that name, I have to say. <laughs> Gwyneth Spica, a lot of consonants. <laughs> As a Slav, I'm, I'm fond of consonants. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we start sort of with the, the, the movie theme, um, just because <coughs> it plays such a role in this book. Um, we were talking a little bit beforehand about how you got into the whole art of screenplay writing. Well, I've always been a movie buff, and back in my youth, I was, um, I called myself and thought I was a film critic. I was very bad at it, but I watched a lot of movies. I grew up by um, a movie theater, and at some point in my teenagehood, I considered becoming a film director, but then I realized that we have to be in charge of, you know, uh, 200 people, and I couldn't be in charge of anything and still can't. <laughs> um, so I've, I've, I've watched movies and, and I'm, I've, I think about them all the time um, and watch them. So it was always lingering on the, on the fringes of my interest, uh, cult general cultural interest. Um, but a few years ago, I have a very good friend, she's a, she's a Bosnian film director, uh, Yasmin Lajbanic, she's brilliant and, and extremely talented. Um, she talked me into writing a screenplay with her. And we decided from the outset um, to make it a comedy. And so we started writing this mainly over Skype. We did spend some time in the same room writing the script, but for four or five years, uh, we were writing a script over Skype while doing other projects. She made another movie while we were writing the script. I published a couple of books, I think, in that period. But it was this... Um, we were writing a script together, first in Bosnian, and then we switched for some reason into English. It's not a mysterious reason, it's just not boring to, it's too boring to talk about. Um, and so this screenwriting thing, I had not had much ambition to, you know, enter film industry, but I, I was, uh, it appealed to me to work with a friend who's a professional filmmaker because it would be, it would be a soft landing, I thought. Um, and so she, I would not have to deal with producers or you know, agents representing Gwyneth Spica. <laughs> uh, and so I started writing this, and it was interesting to me. It was an entirely different mode of, of generating a story. On the one hand, it's collaborative, and I do not collaborate much when I write my books. And also, um, the nature of screenwriting is such that you have to eliminate language, as it were. Whatever cannot be metaphors and similes don't work in scripts, I learned quickly only what can be seen or imagined as being on screen ends up in a script. And so it required a kind of discipline that I hadn't had before simply because I hadn't tried it. And so as we were doing this, we were doing this for years, I, at the same time I had this idea for a long time, because when I was teaching English as a second language, I had a student, she was Russian, 
who um, hit on me after class, although she was married and had a child of 10 years. And I, I passed on that opportunity. I was involved with someone at the time, and it was unethical. Um, <laughs> sadly, for a writer, I'm, I, I'd like to think of myself as a decent person, so I just passed on this opportunity. Otherwise, it would have been a memoir. <laughs> But because I'm too decent for memoirs, uh, uh, I I kept imagining what would have what would that have been like, you know, having an affair with a, your married student, whose husband is the next classroom, uh, and so I, um, because I think about things, stories for years, I hadn't really tried to write this until one day, I was avoiding some other work, and wrote a story. Uh, in one sitting, in six hours, that you know, featured reimagined situation like this: a uh, student uh, and an ESL teacher getting involved. So, anyway, somehow that c got connected with Joshua and this whole uh, movie theme. So Joshua became a screenwriter who then enters an illicit love affair with his student, and then I kept um, I, um, in order to pursue this and research, I. Entered a, a creative write, not creative, uh, screenwriting. Sorry, not creative writing, screenwriting workshop, kind of incognito. Um, I, I mean, I told everyone I was a writer, but they didn't they didn't know who I was. And I was there in a workshop, um, generating pages every week and developing these these ideas. And you know, had to come up with a new chapter or new event in the book by next week. What I'm trying to say is that I wrote a script for the book um, uh, before I actually wrote the book. You, we were discussing the sort of um, types of work that was coming out of this class. <laughs> Do you feel comfortable saying? Well, this is this is low grade uh, screenwriting people who are amateurs, as I was, am still, really, um, people who after work come in and, and they sort of play out their um, screenwriting fantasies, with no, um, because nobody is really going to make a living of that. Then you can switch and change your ideas and just uh, drop out. There was at some point um, a woman, she, she was there only for one uh, class, but she came, she wanted to adapt a book that was written by someone who had spent f 40 years or so living in the same shack and communicating with the angels. It was a memoir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a self-published memoir, and she was trying to get the rights for this book. Um, and so this person, the, the writer of this book, was talking to um, to angels for you know forty years, and was transported by angels to heaven at various point. And at some point, was uh, the angels who took him to uh, to God's throne, and he sat at at God's throne in one of the chapters of the book. This is a woman, and she was pitching this to us, describing what she would like to write about. And my heart started beating really fast. It was like you know God sent me a gift. <laughs> For my book, <laughs> <laughs> and then and she was describing, you know, um, this scene as she imagined it of, of the the narrator sitting at God's throne, and the workshop um, instructor said, "Oh, that's going to be expensive." <laughs> 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 and so yeah, that that line is in the book too. But it was it was it was God's gift to me. Although I don't believe in God, but I guess he was he was, he was recruiting me at the time. <coughs> So um, I actually find some of Josh's script ideas to be good, some of them. <laughs> Saved by the punny title, maybe. Um, well, he was not untalented. He's just lazy and confused and true. cannot finish anything. <laughs> well, in the events of his life, um, I, it, while I was reading it, I was thinking, you know, in some ways, these scenarios he's getting himself into, you know, with the, the teacher relationship and a series of other very comical things that happen, it, it's like it's becoming a form of cinematic um, plot. But I always find that a little odd when people say this reminds me of a movie because obviously we draw from life to make movies, so it's kind of this sort of strange observation. Um, as the events were unfolding, th was that something you had in mind that s he's this sort of lazy, you know, can't make things happen, sort of weak person, but yet swirling around him is all this drama? Well, I mean, one of the aspects of the book, and it's not in instantly uh, visible, is this is all taking place at the time of the Iraq invasion um, um, in 2003. And so one of the things I wanted to 
deal with, but not necessarily in the foreground, is this situation which our individual weaknesses were transcended by the fantasy of a powerful nation invading other countries. And this, uh, the, you know, the, the decider, uh, George Bush, he and allowed for a lot of people, and we should not forget this ever, I can't, that uh, it allowed, you know, had an approval rate of about 90% at the time of the Iraq invasion. It's a very appealing fantasy um, that we are just, you know, big and powerful, and it, it compensates for individual um, individual short shortcomings. So I wanted Joshua, I mean, he's, he's, he's all right. He's a, he's a nice guy. He's moderately talented, slightly lazy, um, slightly too privileged to have to be assertive. But as he's working his way through these, this affair and complications of his life and the script of zombie wars, he's arriving at this point where he uh, has a, a kind of agency, but it's the wrong kind of agency. Um, this is the part, I've, I've described this book as a roller coaster ride of violence and sex. This is where the violence part uh, comes in. For years when people asked me, and some of you may have asked me before, what my book or next book was about, as a joke, I would say it's a roller coaster ride of violence and sex. <laughs> and I fi finally I lived up to my bullshit. <laughs> Always my ambition, yes. Well, as um, we could tell by that reading, there's some very funny parts in this book. Um, I definitely laughed out loud, which is always a weird experience to be reading by yourself and laughing. <laughs> um, I feel it happens on the L sometimes, and people look over like, what? But um, it's very funny. And uh, we were talking a little about sort of that trying to incorporate humor and, and what that process <coughs> is like. Um, did you have, a, was that a fun experience to try to infuse it with a lot of jokes and? Uh, it, it is, it, I mean, I have had funny parts in my other books, but they were not organized around uh, humor. And so when I was writing this book, one of the things I wanted, it, I wanted to be different from other books in some ways, and most important, I wanted to be funny so that, you know, if I was in doubt how to resolve a certain situation or, or, or scene or anything, then uh, I would always err on the side of funny. Um, and I didn't realize, I hadn't realized this until I started writing this film with my friend. We decided it would be a comedy and then writing a book. How dangerous and difficult um, that is. This movie um, that we wrote premiered in Europe this past summer. I don't know if it's coming here, if ever, United States. And I went for the premiere, uh, its first showing in Sarajevo as a film festival. So I was in a room with 2,000 people who are going to see a movie that I am responsible for, at least partly, and it's supposed to be comedy. And if they don't laugh, I'm going to die. <laughs> because there's no space for negotiation. No one is going to you know, see a comedy and 10 days later say, oh, that was funny. <laughs> it, you either laugh at the moment when it's funny or you don't. And if you don't laugh, that's it. There's no other way. There's no, you know, with uh, complicated, difficult, uh, um, uh, dramatic uh, you know, narrative works, there are several ways to get to it and out of it, but with, with comedy, it's, it's really risky. I started admiring people who work in comedy and you know, write comedy. It's really horrifyingly terrifying. Uh, well, there's a moment in the book, too, where you kind of talk about the subjectivity of humor or its inability to translate because there's um, a dinner party where there's a joke being told in Bosnian, and then um, Anna, his student, tries to explain that it just doesn't translate well, and he's like, no, no, try it, try it on me. And she tries, but it's kind of a forced experience. So I think that that's interesting that you included a bit about humor's <laughs> failure. Right, but it becomes a sad story if it's not, in, you know, um, if it's not translated properly. Um, and I've, I've done it, I've translated jokes before, and I like doing that because they're not, sometimes they're funny, but never as funny as in the original language or at least not to Bosnians, but they become stories. They become stories in that, in that transposition. They're, they're, not com they're lost maybe as jokes, but they become uh, good stories. And that, to me, it's, it's one of the narrative strategies that I like to, um, to deploy. Well, this book, ha like some of your other writing, has um, this kind of theme in the background of language and the ways we use language um, for misunderstanding or to convey truth um, throughout. In, in addition to the script ideas that Joshua has, he's always 
sort of quoting life philosophies and... Um, He's into Spinoza yeah. because his <laughs> in college he was a film studies major and philosophy minor. Uh, and so he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's Jewish, but he's, you know, sees himself in this um, secular um, Jewish tradition because Spinoza was the first secular Jew uh, because he was thrown out of the religious community. And so this is very cool for, for Joshua. So he randomly and inappropriately often quotes Spinoza. And it seems that when circumstances get more dire, he switches over to the Bible. Yeah, he switches. Yeah, this um, the he switches over. A lot of quotes are from the from the Haggadah, the what is read at, at Passover, because at the end of this book takes place in the spring of two thousand three and, and ends uh, with a, a cedar at his family, in a way that does not reveal too much about the nature of it. So as he's you know he's moving away from Spinoza and going to, toward uh, more. Um, trans-like discourse of uh, religious literature. How did the zombie aspect um, figure in? Because there's a, a funny line in there where one of the members of the writing workshop says, is it just because Hollywood? <laughs> 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 well, um, zombies are everywhere. And it's recently I read a news item that in Minneapolis, um, there was a, a zombie pub crawl. They have it in Chicago, too. And one of the zombie crawlers stumbled drunk on someone's porch, uh, a porch of the house. And there was a 16-year-old girl, and she thought there was a zombie invasion going on. And so she locked herself in the closet and called police in panic because she thought that zombie apocalypse has started. Um, and you know, it was this close, really. They might be outside as we speak. But this threat of this threat of un the undead, it, it could be interpreted metaphorically in so many ways. Uh, and movies have been made, uh, although I don't watch those movies anymore, um, with, you know, that, that implicate zombies as third world immigrants or uh, some kind of disease and, and so on. So it, it lingers everywhere in the culture. Now, I have not studied this, to tell you the truth. I did not watch any of the recent zombie works other than World, World uh, War Z, because I thought I was midway in the book, in the middle of the book, and I thought, if they're doing the same thing as Joshua <laughs> in, in his zombie wars, then that's, that's going to constitute a problem. I might have to switch to vampires. <laughs> <laughs> but World War Z pro pro proved no problem in, in that regard. Beca because I wanted to imagine from, from scratch, as it were, I did not want to study zombies, but wanted to... Um, have Joshua's mind generate those things. And, you know, it's necessarily uh, anachronistic in a sense that it's, there have been so many zombie movies made between 2003 and now, and it could, that could be interpreted in any number of ways. It could tie in into, you know, 9-11 and, and, uh, and, and the invasion of Iraq and now Ebola in so many ways. It, the, the myth of zombies and other creatures, superheroes or vampires, the screen receive the projection of, of the cultural fears and, and paranoias and, uh, and fantasies um, in many ways. So I wanted to en engage with that. Um, they provide, of course, zombies a kind of philosophical problem, ontological problem. Are they dead or are they not dead? They are the undead, the living dead, and so on. Um, so I, I, that fe features in the book. It ties in with Spinoza, Spinoza and zombies. It also it's seems a, that it's a winning combination. <laughs> 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 it it seems sort of perfect for something for Josh to be fascinated with because he has trouble moving plots forward, but zombies just right, <laughs> seem yeah. like he he just says, "I'm going to call it the making of zombie wars," and he has like one or two details that he brings to his um, screenwriting workshop, and they're his um, fellow screenwriters are like, and <laughs> he's like, "No zombies." And what else? <laughs> and what else? <laughs> Um, yeah, if you w would you like to read your other passage, switching from the dramas of zombies to the dramas of English as a second language? English yeah. as a second language. Um, since Joshua is, a, is an English as a second language um, teacher, uh, some of the action in the book takes place in the classroom, always related to his students. So this is from the beginning of an early chapter. There were seven students in Joshua's level five ESL class, and they sat there facing him like a jury that had already reached its grim verdict. 
in the far back row, as far from Joshua's dubious authority as they could get, sat Captain Ponomarenko and his rotund wife, Larissa. Captain Ponomarenko had been an officer of the KGB, unhappily decommissioned by the collapse of the USSR, and still resenting the fact that America, the land of limp imbeciles, amply represented by teacher Josh, somehow managed to win the Cold War. He steadily aimed his barbed questions and contemptuous scowls at teacher Josh, while the fair and lauded Larissa endorsed whatever her husband was hatefully thinking. Presently, they were convinced that teacher Josh was personally and primarily responsible for the ongoing invasion of Iraq. They brought up the whole mess in nearly every class, and not at all because they cared about the Iraqis, let alone democracy or justice, but rather to expose the eternal rottenness of America's imperialist soul. Accordingly, Joshua had become adept at changing the subject and pushing the class toward discussing the challenges they would face while, say, acquiring a fish tank. <laughs> then there was a pair of heavily postmenopausal matryoshki who could not possibly care less about invadable distant lands or English grammar or anything at all save for the intimidating presence of black people in the new country. <laughs> the ladies never offered any thoughts, stories, or opinions that failed to reiterate the belief, their belief that African Americans were inherently criminal. The squatter of the two, Yekaterina, had been blessed with having once heard of a black stealing a car door off its hinges, which provided her with a conversation topic for the rest of her natural life. <laughs> there was Fyodor, an ex-rocket scientist prone to randomly quoting Dostoevsky in Russian, who had demanded that Joshua help him translate an old VHS player manual. Expertly egged on by Captain Soviet, he'd taken Joshua's claim that VHS was obsolete at the beginning of the new millennium as yet another instance of blind American selfishness. <laughs> then there was Varya, who, it had recently turned out, was ifly progressing through brutal chemotherapy. She'd been coming to class wearing a variable headscarf and sat always silent under the colorful map of Israel, all of which had misled teacher Josh into thinking she was orthodox. Only after he'd forced the class into one of those role-playing exercises whereby Captain Ponomarenko had become the doctor and Varya the patient had it come out that she'd been battling advanced ovarian cancer. Since teacher Josh could formulate no appropriate response to the immense fact of cancer, he would consequently find himself providing the medical vocabulary for the entire female genital area. He had clumsily scratched a lily-shaped vagina on the board discovering along the way that he was entirely oblivious to many of its parts <laughs> and could not remember the words for others. <laughs> the evil Ponomarenkos had kept nudging each other and chuckling either at his ignorance or at his embarrassment, likely both. The only bright light in all that past Cold War darkness was Anna, she of the downcast eyes. A Bosnian in her late 30s, Anna was his best student by a long shot, not least because she was kept away from the collective contempt of the whispering Russians, congenitally infected by Soviet malice. She used to study medicine, she'd said, adding a few small parts of the vagina floor plan, including a clitoris most impressive, rendered as a large dot. <laughs> she'd done it so unabashedly that Joshua thought up a pun, unabashedly, which often came to him whenever he laid her eyes on her. And she was easy on the eye, too. She was partial to knee-high skirts and cleavage-enhancing decolletage, her heels high enough to be sexy, never high enough to be slutty. Her fashion style, however, seemed wholly incongruous with the indelible sorrow she constantly radiated, which Joshua found as compelling as her curves. One day, he had given his students an assignment to write about their respective hometowns and read them aloud. The Ponomarenkos were from Vitebsk, a town barely worthy of a lazy paragraph. The Moscow Matryoshki drew a poor picture of the magnificent monuments built by the Tsars and Bolsheviks. Varya was from Kazakhstan and wrote about the radiant and radioactive beauty of the desert. But Anna, raising her sea green eyes to meet Joshua's, read his composition mournful, her composition mournfully, recalling the normal life back in Sarajevo, her hometown, before the war. People greeted one another on the street. The youth danced all night. There was a linden tree smelling sweetly and quaintly right under her window. He understood 
that her hot attire did not signify promiscuity, contrary to the consensual interpretation of the other male teachers, but a kind of nostalgia. This was what she used to wear when she was happy, when she used to live the normal life. She simply couldn't let go, just as Captain Soviet could not let go of his Cold War bullshit, ovaria of her cancer. All bodies agree in certain things. Thanks. So the characters in that class, um, even just in a few short sentences, I can picture them so well. How do you go about finding inspiration for the particular characters that populate this book and other books you've written? Well, I pay attention to people, uh, generally, I hope. Um, um, it, people are endlessly fascinating to me in, in their gestures and, and the way they operate, and, and for various reasons. Um, everyone has a story once you scratch, once you um, allow for a situation which people would go past their, you know, societally approved uh, small talk and uh, the screens that we make around ourselves trying to communicate without actually saying, saying anything. Uh, and um, being a writer for such a long time, uh, I developed, uh, I suppose, I hope, a kind of sensibility that allows me to, you know, catch the frequencies that are not immediately detectable. At the same time, I guess it's partly vanity. I'd like to think that I've become a writer because somehow people are interesting to me. It intensifies my interest in, in, in people. I did teach English as a second language, and there was a wide range of people in that, in, in my experience. That Joshua's point of view is, is biased because he's constantly insecure, so everyone looks threatening to him. They're a jury, you know, reaching their grim verdict. I didn't feel my students as, as a jury, so there were, um, there was a wide range, including <laughs> a, a former uh, Red Army captain who kept judging me from the back row. So. I always remembered him. He would nod as I was poke like this. As in, yes, yes, exactly what I thought. <laughs> it was very disconcerting, so, but I survived that. Um, how about the fact of um, your decision to set this book um, in Chicago? Um, was that just instinctive? You've set other books. Well, I mean, I, where else? <laughs> Are there any other cities? Um, this Chicago is a little more abstract than in my other books. There's a geography that I can picture, but the, the plot or the people are not so invested in that geography. They do not necessarily, because the main character, is Joshua Levin, he's you know American. He he has a different relationship with the space around him, different from my other characters who were immigrants, um, and so they were negotiating, you know, spatially. Uh, with their surroundings. And so it is in Chicago, but Chicago is not present and it's I in a way that it was present in the, er in the earlier books. In your um, past book, uh, The Book of My Lives, which was a book of nonfiction essays, um, you were talking about how you have part of Chicago becoming home for you is you finding your spot, like you had to have your barber or your, you know, coffee shop, and Josh seems like that too. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was done by my barber. <laughs> Same barber for many years, it's a whole family. <laughs> Top of your list. Um, this is what I, this is one of the great achievements of in my life in Chicago, I have to tell you this. My barber offered to share his Viagra with me. <laughs> <laughs> Unsolicited, I have to say, completely because he feels so comfortable with me and I feel comfortable with him. He, uh, I can't remember exactly how, but he said, do you, do you need some Viagra? Yes, I, I, he says, it, it's great. <laughs> it's a different meaning of like, really I got works. a guy. <laughs> and I said, no, it's okay. He said, no, take it, just I have four pills, but they're so strong that he, he breaks them up. So he was, he was willing to give me two. <laughs> so that's, that's, you know, I earned after 20 some years in Chicago. <laughs> I, have, I have a Viagra, <laughs> Viagra dealer. <laughs> If I wanted one. <laughs> well, Josh in the book has um, Joshua. Sorry, he corrects people. Um, he has his haunts that he goes to. In fact, his Chicago's very like boiled down to his local bar where he's he hangs the out. Westmoreland. Where he drinks only red wine. From Martini. Because he's glasses. a screenwriter. 
Um, Martini glasses, yes. Yes, and and his uh, girlfriend's apartment, and his world just seems pretty small. And do you think that's that was a a conscious decision that you made to kind of keep the action mostly in his head? At first? Well, it is. It's. I mean, it's. Um, because he's mainly in his head, which is confused, and you know, in, in that head, many things are happening simultaneously. Spinoza quotes, script ideas, the problems with women, and then men he has. Um, so you know, he doesn't really, he's not, an, um, he's not oriented toward the outside. He doesn't spend time contemplating the world around himself, uh, but rather he's, he's, he stays inside. It was one of the things that was interesting to me was exactly that. I, d um, I mean, I've done characters with me, you know, who spend most of their time in their head, but I wanted Joshua to move with this sensibility to through a plot. So this mind, my previous books were, were they were more discursive. They contained situations rather than plots. But I wanted with this book to actually have a, a plot in a sense that, you know, event A leads to event B, which then leads to event C. And so there's a causal relation between things that, that happen to him. The causes are not clear to Joshua. To them, they're confusing. But we can follow that uh, as readers. And so to have this mind that is defined by insecurity and ind indecision, being put in a situation where some kind of decision has to be made, um, it, it, it does not necessarily eliminate the, uh, the surroundings, but the focus um, was necessary, I thought, to be maintained on Joshua, not the city of Chicago, or you know whatever else. So he doesn't pay much pay much attention to the world around him unless it somehow bespeaks something about him. Uh, so he's he's one of those. I think we are going to open it up to questions. Um, I <coughs> have heard that we have a mic that we will pass around, so you don't have to yell. Um, the mic's over here. So if there's any questions anyone has about the making of the making of zombie wars. <laughs> this question isn't really about, oh, sorry, oh, okay. um, about the book per se, but just something I maybe sort of picked, you know, in the, during the interview. Um, and you said that you didn't believe in God. And I was wondering if you could just make a few comments. Um, people talk about that all the time. And I, I wonder what questions, what, what, what do you think they mean when they say God? Well, um, I don't believe in God, but I, I'm not one of those atheists that, who just dismisses all people who believe in God as fools who could not you know, handle things that atheists can. There's a whole school of, I think, they even the name in the new atheism which just dismisses everyone who believes in God, whether you know, Hitchens was one of those and uh, Richard Dawkins, the scientist. To me, that is just, um, um, well, it's wrong, uh, shortly, bec in short, because there's so many things were produced within the, um, the discourse of religion that are just beautiful and human. And, and where even if that discourse was organized around an empty center, the empty center being the non-existent God, it, is so, it contains so much human experience that it cannot simply be dismissed. I have a hard time dismissing Bach and his, you know, St. Matthew's passion because, well, God doesn't exist. S see what I mean? And so engagement with the idea of God covers the whole range of humanity. Not, it doesn't just work for religious people. It works for me, too. So, and then in this particular book, there's Spinoza, who you know, was, had his problems with um, that particular, um, the more orthodox and uh, 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 traditional range of religious discourse. But he was engaged with the idea of God. He just redefined God in a, um, in a way that did not comply with the, the, uh, the uh, demands of the religious, Jewish religious community in, uh, in Amsterdam in, in, in the 17th century. So, and I find his ideas brilliant and beautiful and I in enjoyed reading that. In fact, I was writing this book and I had a draft in which there was no Spinoza at all. And since I'm lazy by nature and always look for a way to do something else, I had a, a, a Spinoza reader next to me while I was trying to um, find reasons not to write the book that I was supposed to write. And I started flipping through this, through Spinoza, uh, through ethics. I hadn't read that uh, for a while. And so I started trying to look for ways in which I could 
implement Spinoza, and therefore the whole idea of of belief in God and nature and, and order and moral order and all these things. And suddenly, uh, you know, in, in this funny book, I, I, I move things around, spread the sentences and chapters to find place for Spinoza. And this is what the notion of God, uh, how it often works. Even if I don't believe or practice it ever, it is always somewhere there. You know, I deal with it, we all deal with it. And to dismiss it as just um, wrong and nonsense, it is, um, well, it's wrong. That doesn't mean that, you know, that the proposition of intelligent design and evolution are equally valid. You know, science is science. I firmly believe in science. So it, it doesn't, the negotiation does not, should not <laughs> happen on that level. We know that certain things are uh, facts, and we also know that science has, um, requires intellectual rigor that, that faith doesn't have by nature of its of its practice. What is it like for you as a writer to teach students of writing? Well, I like teaching uh, when I don't have to. Um, that is when I, it's not my full-time job and I, I don't, you know, trying, I'm not trying to do something else. Because I like, I like, I love literature and I like writing, I like, lo like reading, I like being engaged with, um, with people who care about it, care enough at least to, um, you know, enter a, a program, a writing program, or come come to my class, and um, I've never had a bad student or, or a stupid student. I've never thought of a student that's not a smart person. The curiosity is always there, and it was. It, I always thought and think it's my responsibility that if it's a little dormant, it is my job to you know to to crank it up. Um, I do not. I uh, sometimes teach creative writing workshop classes, but I had never gone through a creative writing workshop when I was writing. I only taught them. I never took those classes. So I tend to adjust that format and or to the point of avoiding it entirely uh, because I think that reading uh, is, is very important and crucial to, um, to, the, the, to writing, to writing anything, writing in general and writing in particular. When I want to write something, my first need is the most urgent need is to read a lot, and not even directly related to things directly related to what I'm working on, but just read. So if I'm not writing, I want to read. I, I expect something uh, something will be figured out in the process of reading. So I love teaching, yes. I just keep thinking about that poor instructor of the screenwriting class that you intended, attended incognito. Do you know if she ever figured it out or knows uh, now I don't the role know. she played? I, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I, I used some lines and, and the, the, the uh, screenwriting workshop I took was nowhere near as, as bad as the one in the book. I, I, for comedic effects, I cranked it up. Um, but I, I wasn't. I wasn't incognito. I, you know, they, we at the beginning of class. They, he asked us, you know, why are you here? What do you want to do? And all this. And I said, I'm a writer. I, I had the story. I want to develop it into, you know, an idea. I'm not sure. I don't have any film ambition. I just want to figure out how screen plays are written and so on. So I wasn't lying to anyone. And you know, I was under my real name. Um, but it's it was it film. I guess it's a different world. Or people who have interest in film. They don't necessarily have interest in literature. So my name meant nothing to them, as it means nothing to billions of people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so they would. Y you are the unusual crowd, not them. <coughs> so may I ask a stupid question? You put this episode that woman, Russian woman or whatever pro proposed to you and you declined. Does it mean that it's reg you regret now because you put it to the... <laughs> the book <laughs> and try to overcome this or something? Well, <laughs> I, you know, I do and I don't. But I, I, I regret it because I always, I don't regret it because I made the right decision. I was an eth ethical person. I, it, it, it would have been wrong to do that. But at the same time, this is nature of writing. I can always imagine the alternative, right? I can always imagine myself as an asshole. <laughs> You know, I can imagine myself doing it, so I constantly question my moral mental because I guess a truly decent person, to a truly decent person, this would be unimaginable, whereas I spend time <laughs> imagining it. 
and because this was happening at the time when I was engaged to someone I would marry then, but then we would get divorced. After the divorce, I, I, maybe I thought, well, maybe I should have done it. <laughs> it would have sped up things, but you know, I still don't regret it. I love your essays, and I wonder what function they serve for you. Do you write them all the time, or do you, how do they come about? Well, I do, I don't write them all the time, but I don't, you know, uh, the essays in the book that, um, the book of my life, I wrote over a period of time. So I never just write one thing, uh, both in terms of the projects, but also in terms of the genre. So I could be writing a novel, and I could be writing a, a non-fiction book or an essay. And so to me, they, they entirely, they complement each other. Um, for one thing, it takes a long time to write a book, and you get focused on one thing or you know, the limited space and number of characters and whatever. But there are all these other ideas and things happening. And to suspend this for five or six years and think, you know, I can't do that. For one thing, I'm not disciplined enough because I have ideas about um, s things simultaneously. I can never pick exactly what I think or wh what is the most important thing to do and think. So to me, it, I, I think through writing. I do not know what I think until I've written things about things that I was thinking about. Uh, so to figure things out, I had to write about them. And so in, those, in that sense, more the essays and, and fiction, but just differently, allow me to, th this is the space and place where I think about things that are important to me. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for sharing your thoughts and your work with us today. It's really been very interesting and delightful. Thank you. Um, you mentioned several times you made comments about writing a humorous book, and I have two questions about that. In approaching, in undertaking writing this book, was your aim to write a humorous book or to have fun in the writing of the book? And my second <coughs> question is, um, how, if at all, did writing a humorous book change or affect your process in writing? Um, well, I do have fun when I write other books. I do not suffer writing. I mean, even if I write difficult stuff because it's a, it's a means of engagement with the world. It's, it's, it's necessary. Uh, and in that sense, it's not just, it is fun, but not just fun. It is, it is what I do. Um, it is like eating. You know, you enjoy some meals more than others, uh, but you cannot not eat. I cannot not eat um, a lot at that. Um, that I think there was uh, writing, uh, this book I think, I hope it's funnier than other books, but I don't think that my other books are not funny, particularly some of them. But it's, it's, a, it's the um, set of expectations that I set for myself, how I would resolve certain things, because a character like Joshua, he, just like everyone, would have deposits of sadness and complicated situations, or self-pity, or anything else. And so to um, create a character or a situation in which that would be less important, not unimportant and not absent, but less important. Uh, it, you know, it, it requires making uh, different decisions in writing. Um, and so there are moments in the book, if you knew the book, I could mention them if I could remember them, where you know, I, had to, I was at a, a crossroads, as it were, or the path was forking. Sh should I do the funny stuff or the less funny stuff? And I would go always go toward the funny town um, in that direction. And this gave me pleasure because this I like to think of myself as funny, but I, I do not just crack jokes all the time. You know, I sometimes often do not crack jokes at all. <laughs> um, but so th th this, was, this was a challenge in itself. I had to, it, it requires a kind of discipline. It's not just, and which is fun imposing discipline, imposing limitations upon yourself. And the writing, or any kind of creative work, is, it starts out in many ways by imposing limitations. This is what I'm not going to do. And then this is what I'm going to do. And that is fun. I like to do things that I haven't done before and figuring things out as I'm doing them. That is very important. This will be our last question. I have a question about being an exile writer. Where up are here. you? <laughs> Over time, does one become less or more of an exile writer? Well, I don't think of myself as an exile writer. Okay. 
um, Nabokov was an exile because once he left, he could never go back. Um, and you know, m any number of, of former um, uh, Eastern Bloc dissidents before the fall of the war, which we celebrate today, the 25th anniversary, uh, you know, they couldn't go back. I can go back. I cannot perhaps go metaphorically back to the past that I lived 30 years ago, but I, I don't, I'm not blocked. Um, or my access to my um, history, the culture, the people, the city, my old apartment is not blocked in that sense. And so, however, that's a question of you know, terminology. I, 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 I like the word displaced better. Uh, so I'm not out of place entirely, but displaced. Uh, and I, I would think that you know, one becomes less so, because I have, Chicago has become my adopted hometown. Nevertheless, there's an aspect, um, I've been thinking about it, where you get, as you get further away from the time that defines you and the place that, def that place in the time that defines you, you know, something changes, it becomes more um, abstract and, and more imaginative. And then uh, something shifts. I cannot quite define whether that's more or less of a displaced writer. Uh, and this is only part of it. The more I live in Chicago, the more I'm placed in Chicago. And I made a conscious decision to establish this as a place of my life, and now it has become so. But it's more and more so. I have s little children who are growing up in Chicago now. And so to re-experience some of the things through their eyes, and you know, to, um, to watch them acquire the city f for their own purposes is, is creates a different bond. But at the same time, they're not doing that in Sarajevo. Then, you know, my older daughter was the only once, and she was 18 months. To her, it's entirely an abstraction. And so it becomes more mine. You know, I, I talk to her. I, have, I tell them stories before sleep that feature talking animals uh, from that part of the world. And to them, it's, uh, it's story land, not, not my homeland. And so something is changing in that regard, but I, I'm not sure exactly where that is going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.